Good morning and welcome to all gathered here and to those who are joining in worship from their homes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Uh, exciting times in the life of the church. Next week, next Sunday, we'll be beginning Sunday school. Uh, our youth program is uh, definitely on the horizon. As you will read in your bulletin, we are we're still seeking some support, uh, some help in those areas. If you're able to join, uh, that will help us carry on the, the ministries of the church this season. Uh, and as we uh, gather, encourage all to, to join in, in praising God as we pray and sing together. Participation in the music can be done in, uh, through reflecting on the words, through humming along. If you want to sing, we do ask that you put your, your mask on uh, to join in, in the singing. Let us worship God together. Come to the cross. Come to the cross where Jesus died. Jesus will meet you there. Feel the love that Jesus poured out for you and me, his very lifeblood. Jesus willingly gave up his life, suffered the worst human pain possible, took the punishment that we deserved, all so that you and I could find forgiveness for our horrible sins and find the only way to heaven, find joy and peace in a real relationship with him. Because when we receive Jesus Christ into our hearts and lives, he becomes our brother. And God becomes our father by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then, and only then, 
can we really pray the Lord's Prayer in talking to our Father in heaven and have the strength and wisdom to become peacemakers, living humbly with our God, to act justly, and to love mercy. Second Chronicles 15 verse 2 says, The Lord is with you as long as you are with him. If you look for him, he will let you find him. But if you turn away, he will abandon you. Let us then seek God with all our hearts so that we will find him. To seek God means spending time faithfully studying his word and regularly finding a place for fervent prayer. Remember, Daniel prayed three times every day. And Paul calls us to pray continually. God's word is the plumb line. You cannot argue with the plumb line. Let us confess our sins, asking Jesus to show where we need to leave our life of sin, as we've just sung, to give up our idols of love for money, the trust in riches and pleasure, seeking a life of comfort and ease, the longing for more and better worldly goods. Let's leave those and surrender completely to the will of the Father as we leave our known and unknown sins. Let us come to him, trusting in him alone for the assurance of salvation to be the anchor of our souls. Jesus is all in all. He promises to meet all our needs. Seek his face today in the truth of the Holy Scriptures. Dust off your Bible and find the only true way to live forever, to be faithful to God's call. What will you and I do this week to make sure that another soul can safely find its way home through Jesus? Join me in prayer. Help us, Father God, as our world is shaking, to look ahead to Jesus. He is coming again. He is in complete control. Make our lives right with you. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We want to love you with all our hearts, minds, strength, and souls. Open our hearts and minds to receive your message today, to say yes to your call as we kneel at the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you promise to meet us there. Amen. Our Moment in Mission video today features the uh, Winnipeg Harvest, where a homeless man, David, finds a new path in life as he learns some new skills and is able to find a secure source for food.
set the world right. Do what's best, as above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. Hi everyone, in the story I'm going to read to you, a little kid named Taylor made the perfect thing, but the things went all wrong. It's called The Rabbit Listened. One day, Taylor decided to build something. Something new. Something special. Something amazing. Taylor was so proud. But then, out of nowhere, things came crashing down. The chicken was the first to notice. What a shame. I'm so sorry, sorry, sorry this happened. Let's talk, talk, talk about it, cluck, cluck. But Taylor didn't feel like talking, so the chicken left. Next came the bear. Grrr, how horrible. I bet you feel so angry. Let's shout about it. Grrr, grrr. But Taylor didn't feel like shouting, so the bear left. The elephant knew just what to do. Trumpeta, I can fix this. We just need to remember exactly how the way things were. But Taylor didn't feel like remembering, so the elephant also left. One by one they came, the hyena, hee let's laugh about it. The ostrich, <gasps> let's hide and pretend nothing happened. The kangaroo, ugh, oh, what a mess. Let's throw it all away. And the snake, shh, let's knock down someone else's. But Taylor didn't feel like doing anything with anybody. So eventually they all left until Taylor was alone. In the quiet, Taylor didn't even notice the rabbit, but it moved closer and closer until Taylor could feel its warm body. Together they sat in silence until Taylor said, please stay with me. The rabbit listened. The rabbit listened as Taylor talked. The rabbit listened as Taylor shouted. 
The rabbit listened as Taylor remembered and laughed. The rabbit listened to Taylor's plans to hide, to throw everything away, to ruin someone else's. Through it all, the rabbit never left. And when the time was right, the rabbit listened to Taylor's plan to build again. I can't wait, said Taylor. It's going to be amazing. When I was reading this story to my kiddos the other day, I had kind of a, an aha moment, I guess. The little bunny in the story reminds me of how I think of God. When we're hurting and sad and things aren't going the way that we want them to, God comes and sits with us. He listens when we're not ready to talk. He listens when we need to yell. He listens when we need to remember and laugh even when we get mad. Just like the rabbit, God never leaves us and is always ready to help us keep going. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for being with us always. Amen. A question of how we respond when a loved one chooses a different path. Here are some scriptures to guide us. From Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost coin! In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In wisdom from the writings of Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? As pastors, this is a question that we hear often in ministry, the pain that people feel, uh, whether it is parents or siblings or friends who, for whatever reason, do not believe in God or do not engage in the life of the church, uh, do not make a confession of faith in Christ. 
the pain is particular for, for parents when their children choose a different path. Uh, because we've prayed for our children every day. We've nurtured them in the ways of the Lord. We've done everything we could to introduce them to Jesus. And yet, our children must make their own choices. We cannot make choices for them. There are three responses that, while very natural, very human, that we need to let go of. And that is the response of guilt, the response of shame, and the response of worry. Sometimes we have the response of guilt because we think, well, couldn't I have done something different? Couldn't I have done something better? And guilt gets us nowhere. Guilt is a, is a burden we unnecessarily carry. As parents, as siblings, as people, none of us are perfect. Uh, we make mistakes. We do the best we can at the time that we could, that we knew how. And that's what we can do. And the out, outcomes of other people's lives are, are not ours to, to control. There are many influences that people face that push and pull in different directions. There was a time when the influences in society and in our community worked to influence people, to guide people toward keeping the faith, toward being a part of a church community. There was a time when being a, being a Christian and being a part of a church perhaps even had some benefit in terms of social standing, prestige in a community. But the world has changed, particularly for people in the, in the baby boomer generation and younger. There are so many influences now that work in the other direction uh, to direct us away from faith in Christ, away from life in the church. Some of these influences are, are the, 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 the tension that we sometimes feel between belief and science, as though we have to, have to choose. Uh, we have to choose between a life of, of intellectual credibility and a life of faith. I don't accept this, uh, this distinction but it is, it is present in the world and it, and it, and it works to, to shift people away from faith. There is a, a sense in the world that our, our, our convictions, our personal religiosity is a, is a private matter. Uh, almost akin to how we take our coffee. What, what works for me is my preference and what works for you is, is your preference. This also makes it difficult to figure out how do we live a, a, a whole life kind of discipleship that's attractive and winsome to people. More and more, the church is not the center of people's social lives in a way that it once was. There are many opportunities for commitments, for involvements. Uh, the loss of the sacred Wednesday night, church night, and even Sunday mornings, they're kind of becoming a, a thing of the past. And this is, a, this is a reflection that as a church, we aren't at the center of 
society in a way anymore. All to say there are so many influences in people's lives. And the direction that a loved one's life goes is not entirely dependent on us and nor should we take on guilt for it because there is such a bigger picture of push and pull that happens in people's lives. And so we can let go of the guilt. We can let go of the guilt and we can let go of the shame. A number of years ago, uh, ministry brought me into relationship with, with an older couple. It was an older couple. They had very clear ideas about what was good and, and what was right, which was not a problem. But for this couple, when they saw dysfunction, when they saw brokenness in other families' lives, They saw their own family not having those challenges and struggles, and it became evidence, proof of, of their own uh, character as parents and how they had taught their children and their grandchildren the right ways and everything. But then something happened. The brokenness and messiness that they saw in their friends' lives it started happening in their family too. And added to the pain of that brokenness was piled on shame, layers of pain. Because it wasn't just the pain of the situations they were living through as a family. It was the pain of a shattered worldview of their own sense of superiority. And they suffered in silence because the shame was so great. They couldn't, they couldn't share, share with their community, with people in their church. There's no shame. There's no shame in how our siblings, our friends, our children, the choices they make, uh, the direction their lives go. It does not bring shame onto us. Jesus liberates us from the shame. We release the guilt and the shame and the worry. And one of the worries that uh, we sometimes have of our loved ones and even of ourselves is that our experience in heaven will be diminished because loved ones are absent. Here's why this should not be a worry. Because the promises that uh, God grants to us in the scriptures of, of eternal life, these promises are about primarily our relationship with God and God dwelling with us again, among us, within us, in, in such an intimate way. Human relationships, I believe in, in some form, they will endure into the age to come. I don't know what that will entail. Uh, but I... I do believe that how God judges and how God redeems and sanctifies is, is, is not our matter to concern ourselves with, with the details. We trust that glory will be just as glorious as God always intended it, and earthly realities like pain in relationships uh, and hurt God will, will redeem that. And so we, we do not need to live in worry that realities in this world 
will infringe upon the joy of the new heavens and the new earth. And so we are liberated. We can let go of any guilt. We can let go of any shame. We can let go of any worry. None of these are helpful in, in, in fostering our own relationship with God or even being a witness to our loved ones. We have to approach the matter with the right motives. And if our, if our desire for loved ones to know Christ is really just a way of reinforcing a worldview of, of we're good and they're bad and we uphold our own righteousness by, by separation. And that's what those who grumbled to Jesus thought. That was their mentality when they saw Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. If our desire for our loved ones to know the Lord is out of a sense of obligation to us, uh, we, we have the wrong motives. There really is only one, one motive, and that is simply that we want people to know the joy and the hope that we experience in following Jesus. And I share with you uh, two hopeful responses to the question of how we respond. To be a searcher and to be a contagion. Uh, to be a searcher. When people came to Jesus and they grumbled, you eat with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus told three parables. The first parable uh, that Jesus told was a parable about a shepherd and sheep. And Jesus says, what shepherd when you lose a sheep does not leave the 99 and go searching for the one? And the, the message of this parable is so shocking because of what the shepherd does with the 99 sheep, the shepherd leaves the 99 sheep in the wilderness. It would make a lot more sense for the shepherd to first make sure that the 99 were safely contained in the, in the sheep pen. Because sheep are defenseless creatures. They cannot move quickly. They have no defenses. So you want to make sure that the sheep are safe. And then you go search for the lost one. That's what you would learn in your introduction to shepherd management class. But this shepherd, in Jesus' parable, just leaves the, leaves the 99 there in the wilderness and then goes searching. The point is, God is a reckless searcher. The second parable emphasizes not the recklessness of God's searching, but the diligence of God's searching. The woman loses a coin, and she lights the, the lanterns, she gets the broom out, she starts sweeping. And it says she searches carefully, thoroughly, until she finds the lost coin. God is a reckless searcher and a diligent searcher. The third parable is the parable of two lost sons and their prodigal father. A father who's so prodigal when that son is ready to come home, the father shamelessly loves him right into a party. If God searches recklessly, thoroughly, 
and loves shamelessly into the kingdom, so should we. But searching is risky. It's hard. See, it, it would be easier just to hang out at the sheep pen and wait for that lost sheep to come home. But being a searcher means, means praying, praying consistently for loved ones. Uh, being a searcher means taking an interest in people, where people are at. Searching means asking questions to uh, discover the, the, the challenges people are facing, the doubts people have, where people are in their spiritual quests. Searching means loving people uh, without any ulterior motives or without expecting things in, in return. I uh, had the opportunity to speak to, to the friend uh, once, and uh, when I asked, uh, I heard some about the direction that, uh, that his, his life had took. And I learned some things. I also had the opportunity to share why I continue to find hope and joy in following Jesus. And I'm glad we're still friends. And I'm glad I asked and we talked. Sometimes when we go searching we find out things that are a little bit inconvenient, that uh, maybe we'd rather not know because it challenges us. Sometimes when I've engaged in conversations with people who have left the church, uh, people who struggle to find faith in God, I've, I've heard some hard things. Uh, hard things about how people, people came to the church with questions and, and doubts, and the church was not a gentle, nurturing, embracing community. Heard about how people came to the church struggling with, with mental health, a mental illness, and they found an image of the church as, as, as projecting itself as a, as a club for people who have it all together. And one thing I've learned in ministry about the church over the years is that we'd like to think we are a club for people who have it all together, but we're not. We are a community of sinners struggling to find our way. And if we are honest uh, about this reality of who we are, we can be a more embracing, a more hospitable community, a community where the lost find welcome, find a place to, to come home to and a place to party. Being a searcher is hard, but it's worthwhile. We can also be a contagion. And I reach for Paul's wisdom in 1 Corinthians on marriage. He offers very practical advice on how do you respond in a marriage where one partner is a Christian and one is not. And the wisdom Paul shares is that this situation in itself is not sufficient reason to end the marriage, to end the relationship. Unless, Paul says, the spouse in the marriage who is not a believer chooses to 
depart the relationship. And the believing partner can release uh, themselves from the marriage, but the Christian in the marriage should not end a marriage in such a circumstance. And the reason that Paul gives is because of the, the contagiousness of holiness. The way that influence can happen. In the same way we know that sin and negative attitudes and behaviors can be contagious. And one specific situation, Paul likens sin to yeast. Uh, just a little bit of that yeast gets in a batch of dough, and it spreads throughout the whole dough. And so in one situation, Paul advocates drawing a boundary to keep that yeast from spreading through the church. But Paul also recognizes that influence happens the other way too. And that hope is contagious, joy is contagious, love is contagious. And that's why remaining in fellowship and relationship is, is so important. It's incumbent upon us as, as Christians to be in fellowship, to be in relationship with, with people, whether they are loved ones or not, who are not Christian. It raises the question, what influence can we have? What are we contagious with? Uh, we can be contagious with complaints and grumblings. We can be contagious with a, a sense of our faith as, as obligation and, and, and duty and burden. Or we can be contagious with joy, with the joy of following Jesus. We can be contagious with the hope that we have in Jesus. We can be contagious with love because God is love. All we can do is search and have influence. And as Jesus said to his disciples, when you go to a village to proclaim the message of the kingdom, and if you're not received in that village, you shake the dust off your sandals and you carry on to another place where you can have influence. The, the burdens of the world, the burdens of our loved ones, it does not all rest on our shoulders. So be free. There is no guilt. There is no shame. And there is no worry. There is only to follow after Jesus in being a searcher and being an influencer. That's the task before us. And may God encourage us in his journey. Amen.
Let us come before the Lord in prayer for our offering, our church, and the world. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you and praise your name. You are in heaven, and yet you have come to us in Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to do more than say, Lord, Lord, to you, but rather to obey all that you teach us in your holy scriptures, to do your will always. Continue to provide for our needs spiritually and physically. Help us to share with others to build your kingdom here on earth and not our own kingdoms. Wash away our sins. Take away our evil desires and make us clean through the blood of Jesus as we recognize our faults. We have sinned against you and you alone. Grant us a forgiving spirit to extend the pardon that you have shown us as we confess our sins to you. Fill our minds with sincerity, truth, and your wisdom. Create a pure heart within each of us. Lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, away from temptation. Holy Spirit, convict us of all our sin, even our wayward children, and draw us to know the love of Jesus and find his forgiveness. Help us to trust your word, to be merciful, and help us to show mercy to others. Bless the tithes and offerings that we bring to you, that everyone may experience your grace. Extend your healing touch to Mary Voth, Walter Schultz, and Ann Kaler. Grant your comfort and peace to the Albert Hoffman family, the Sadie Funk family, and the Margaret Litkeman family as they mourn the loss of a dear family member. Thank you for the joy of a 90th birthday for our Dick. Continue to protect the people in Burkina Faso churches as they work for peace. Thank you for all our church workers and we pray that you would provide Sunday school staff and youth sponsors for our children. Father, send your gospel of hope and freedom to so many who are suffering and needy today. We think of all those who are in danger from wildfires. Protect them, enable them to find help, safety, and peace. COVID-19 is causing so much pain. Provide healing and comfort for all as we trust in you. All honor, glory, and praise to you, our matchless God. Amen. And now as we part, let's stand for the blessing and stay standing for the music. May God, the source of hope, fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him so that your hope will overflow by the power of the Holy Spirit to him who is able to keep you from falling and to bring you faultless and joyful before his glorious presence. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority from all ages past and now and forever and ever. Amen.
you will